There are many different facets to property investing. Things like what strategy to use, which area to invest in, how to leverage other people's money with different finance techniques, how to go through the transfer process, and then most importantly, how to manage the assets so that it performs well uh, by doing things like evictions and renovations, tenant vetting and marketing. Unfortunately, we're not taught all of these things um, and we have to end up learning through the school of life by making mistakes. So the reason why I've put this quick video together is to share with you the basics of getting started in property. So if you've never bought a property or you've bought one or two and you're looking to scale your investment, this is the perfect video for you to get started. And the reason why I've decided to record this video is because a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago asked me, um, you know, how do I get started? I've got a job, I've got about 100,000 in the bank, I wanna get into property, but I don't wanna make a mistake. What's the starting point? So that's the purpose for this video. If you like my content and you wanna see more of it, remember to click subscribe, click the notification button so that you're reminded. Now there's different ways you can do property, right? You can, you can be an agent or sourcing specialist, do wholesaling. This is where you bring a buyer and a seller together and you make a commission off the sale. You can do flipping, buy, renovate, sell, you can go into the low income market buying a block of flats or you can go into the multi-led market by doing something like student accommodation. The question is, where do you want to go? Um, and that's a hard question to answer and it's not something that you can just say, I want to do sourcing. You need to understand what the ramifications of that decision are. So the agenda for today is to look at how can you pick the right strategy, how to get started, uh, how you can finance your investment, what area you need to choose in order for your strategy to make sense. We'll look at a deal analysis, how to structure your business, personal name, trust, company, um, signing an OTP and offer to purchase, how to do the transfer window, and then the management of your investment. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Lawrence. I'm a, a professional property investor, been in the property game for 10 years, and the reason why I started property is because uh, when I started working in corporate, I realized that you know I'm, I'm stuck working for an underpaying, under an un, ungrateful boss. Um, and I wanted to have a side hustle that was passive that gave me a bit of flexibility and freedom. So I'm still a full-time employee. I work as a cybersecurity analyst, but I've got a property portfolio that is um, generating passive income. I don't take any money out of the business because I just want to keep reinvesting so that I can reach a critical mass. Um, but I am financially independent, meaning that if I were to lose my job, I could sustain my lifestyle of my company. I'm also a business coach focusing on helping uh, start out investors get into the property game. Um, I'm also an author. They are my two books. Please go and check them out in exclusive books. Okay, you can also connect with me on social media. Here are my different handles, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, and of course, YouTube. Let's talk about strategy. How do you know what strategy you're gonna focus on? There's two key questions that you need to answer in order to work out what your best strategy is gonna be. Question number one, what is your investor archetype? And two, what resources do you have to make this happen? So your investor archetype is a, is a key question. We're basically asking the question, what kind of investor do you want to be? Some people are extroverted, some people are introverted. Some people like to think at big picture, some people like to, f to think small data and, and, and like to be sensory. Being different isn't a bad thing. What's important is understanding yourself, self-awareness, to know what is natural for you, what's easy for you, and then focusing on that as opposed to trying to fix your weaknesses or trying to fix into a box that doesn't fit your natural need. So when we're thinking about strategy, there's essentially two ways that you can make money in property. You've got way number one, which is positive cash flow. This is where you buy and hold a property and the rent needs to be greater than the expenses, leaving you with a passive recurring income. Then you've got the equity gains strategy. This is where you buy at a discount, you force the value of the property to appreciate either by renovating it or letting time do its magic and then selling at a profit, making an equity profit. Right? So those are the two ways. You're either buying and holding for the recurring passive income or you're buying and selling for the equity gain. So if we look at these two different strategies, uh, they, they're two different archetypes. If you're, if you're a cash flow investor, that means you don't buy into the appreciation model. If you're an appreciation investor, you don't buy into the cash flow model because they are very different. They, they're completely different strategies. Let me show you why. So if you're going for the cash flow strategy, remember this is the buy and hold. You've got your rent, which is greater than your expenses, you're left with a positive cash flow. So on a month to month basis, that is where you make your money 
in the cash flow strategy. If you go the appreciation route, this is where you're buying in a nice affluent area and you're hoping that over time that the property is going to be worth more than it was when you bought it. That doesn't make sense from a month to month basis because the appreciation model means that your rent will usually be less than your expenses, meaning you've got a shortfall which you have to fund with your salary. Right, so if you go in the appreciation model on a month to month basis, the property is likely going to lose, lose money. But then on the flip side, the cash flow strategy, which makes money on a month to month basis, does not appreciate in value. You can see here that I've used a, a quick symbol to show that over time, the property market in the lower income market where cash flow works, there's not much appreciation between minus five and 5%. So your, your, the value of your property doesn't go up substantially when you're focusing on cash flow versus the appreciation. This is where you make your money, right? If you're buying in the, in the suburbs, in the high income, in the affluent areas, the Santons, the, the um, Umschlangas, the green points, over time you're making your money because the properties in those areas tend to appreciate between five to 10% in value. So are you the cash flow investor where you want the monthly recurring income and you don't mind that the appreciation doesn't happen? Or are you an appreciation investor? You want to invest in the higher income areas where yes, your cash flow is negative, but your appreciation is where you make your money. So let's break this down a little bit more. You're either going to be a cash flow investor or an appreciation investor. And you're either going to focus on cash flow, which is long-term holds, recurring income, and in my mind, quite stable. And then you've got the appreciation model. This is where you've got short-term holds. You're holding it for a shorter period of time. You're making once-off profits and it's speculative, right? I mean, no one can tell you that Santon's gonna go up by 10% year on year. You know, you, you've, got to, you've got to make that speculation yourself and you've got to then take your position and, and hope it works out. Now, once you've got those two, once you've decided on those two, the next decision you have to make is what area are you going to focus on? What LSM market are you going to focus on? So you've got your low LSM market and you've got your high LSM market. Now, LSM is a fancy word for income bracket. So your low income bracket market is like the center of Joburg CBD. Uh, you know, your lower income areas, your, your inner cities, your highly densely populated areas, your high LSM or your high income areas are more like your Bryanston's, your suburbs, your, um, your affluent areas. All right. So you've got to make the decision. Are you going to go low income? So inner cities, so low income areas have higher risk, but they also have higher rental yields. So they work really, really well for cash flow. They don't work well for appreciation. They've got lower appreciation than your high LSM market. Or you're going to go your high LSM market. This is your affluent areas. It's lower risk from a tenant perspective. You're going to get tenants that are a little bit, you know, more employed or earn a higher income. The, the rental yield is low, right? This is where the appreciation strategy works well. The cash flow tends to suffer a little bit. So if we break this down, essentially you've got what I like to call your four different archetypes. So we're starting to try and figure out what kind of archetype, what kind of investor do you want to be? So if you want to be the cash flow investor, I call this the landlord. And within the landlord space, you're either going to be an accumulator, which means you're focusing on the low income market. So you're focusing on things like single apartments, multi-lets, blocks of flats, houses of multiple occupation, but all in the low income space holding for 20 year periods where your cash flow is positive, right? Your rent is greater than your expenses. Or you're going to be on what I call the curator side of being a landlord. And this is more where you're looking at your, at your affluent areas. Now, if you still want positive cash flow in your affluent areas, you're going to have to look at things like your Airbnb model or guest houses, student accommodation, new builds. I've marked it in red there because it is in your affluent areas, but it tends to be a negative cash flow strategy, which means you're not making that monthly profit. You can also try the single lets, the multi lets, the HMOs. But again, in, in your high income markets, those tend to be negative cash flow unless you're putting a lot of cash down, uh, which in that case, your return is going to suffer. So are you an accumulator, meaning you want to accumulate as many properties as you want in your low income market for great positive cash flow? Are you a curator? Are you a caretaker? Do you want to, do you want to create a holiday space like an Airbnb or guest house environment for people? Um, so that's the landlord option. If you want to be in the appreciation space, I call this the trader, someone who's in and out of deals, you know, not someone who's, who's, who's holding land for a long period of time, like a landlord would, but more someone who's in and out of the market. 
Now here you've got two different types. Again, you've got your innovator. This is someone who's in the low income market wanting to trade. And I call it the innovator because the low income market doesn't have a lot of appreciation potential. Um, but with that being said though, I've also had a student who's done flips in the inner cities. So it's 100% possible, but you have to be an innovator. You have to see things that others can't see. So here's where flipping has gained a lot of popularity. Buy low, force appreciation through renovating, sell high. Your developments, your blocks of flats. You've also got on the right hand side, this is where you're going for your higher LSM market, so your suburbs, your affluent areas, and again, you wanna be trading, so flipping, developments, commercial. Uh, this is where you know you can buy a uh, property that is not modern, modernize it, and sell it for a nice juicy profit. So which one are you? Are you looking for cash flow? Or are you looking for appreciation? Do you wanna be in the low income market that is high risk, high yield, or do you wanna play it safe and go into your higher income market, which tends to have a lower yield? You know, this, this is something you have to answer for yourself. I personally have decided to go for the accumulator model. I like the low income market. I want the cash flow. I go for the blocks of flats, the houses of multiple occupation. I'm happy to invest in those areas and I'm happy to take the risk that comes with those areas. All right, so what, what is gonna be your investor archetype? The second question now to figure out what your strategy is, is what resources do you have? What can you do, All right? How much time do you have? How much capital do you have and what skills knowledge or experience do you have the, the the combination of these three things will tell you what is possible versus what is impossible so if we look at for example the accumulator strategy and let's say you're going to go single let so you're going to go buy to let you're going to buy apartments in the inner cities and in highly dense areas which have a good gross yield what you're going to need is you're going to need time you're going to need capital and you're going to need skills all right, the time that you're going to need is roughly 10 hours to close a deal. So from finding a deal, negotiating to closing it, roughly 10 hours. That's not a lot of time. Most people can find 10 hours in their lives to be able to invest in a deal. And it takes about two hours per month to manage. If you've got a good letting agent, it might take less. If you've got a bad letting agent, it might take a bit more. Capital, you're going to need a minimum of 100,000 Rand. And that's for buying costs, deposits, legal fees, that kind of stuff. You'll also need affordability of at least 300,000. So, you know, you'll need a salary of probably about five to 10,000 as a minimum um, to get started in this strategy. And you'll need a good credit score, right? The banks are willing to loan on these kind of investments, but they want to make sure that you as the, as the person taking surety on the loan have the ability to pay it off. Skills, well, you'll need a really good letting agent. You'll need some knowledge on how to maintain a property and you'll need to know how to do an eviction because when you're targeting your lower income market, eviction is part of the territory. It's, it's gonna happen more regularly than it would in your higher income areas. Let's say that you still wanna go the accumulator route but you've decided you wanna go blocks of flats. So this is where you go for bigger strategies. Instead of buying a single apartment, you're buying 10 apartments in one building. So you're buying the entire building. For example, on the right here, you can see a block of 10 units. So you're buying 10 apartments in one purchase. Now here, your time is substantially higher. You're gonna need a roughly 30 hours to close. So from finding to negotiating to, to closing the deal, at least 30 hours. And you'll need four hours per month to manage. Again, depending on how good your letting agent is. It could be less, it could be more. Capital. The banks don't really like to touch these investments. Um, at best, you're gonna get a commercial loan which will, will most likely kill the deal. So your home loans, they're not gonna to touch this. So the reason why I like this strategy is because um, not many people can buy these buildings because you need the cash. So I go out, I find my private investors, my angel investors, I bring them together, we go and buy these blocks of flats together. So you're gonna need at least two million of private cash, either your own money or other people's money, but the bank is not really applicable in this strategy. Skills. I would say only after five years of being in the property market and having bought, you know, let's say five to 10 apartments in your low income market, are you ready for a block of flat investment? And you need a really good power team, an eviction specialist, a maintenance team, a letting agent, etc. Maybe you wanna go the curator route, right? Student accommodation. So this is something that has gained a lot of popularity in the last few years. It, obviously there was a bit of a bump in the road with COVID and people got scared of it, but now things are starting to normalize. So student accommodation is something that's very interesting. The time required to close is roughly 20 hours, but your management time is substantially higher than any other strategy. And the reason being, 
you know, students tend to take a lot to manage, right? You're going to have to uh, re-vet and refine students every single year. Every year there's going to be an, an outflow and inflow of new students. Um, one of the, the things that we do in our student houses is we, we give more Wi-Fi, but we also remove access to Wi-Fi when a student doesn't pay. So every time we bring new students into our building, we have to add them to our Wi-Fi management list. And then every time they miss payment, we have to go into that list and we have to deactivate their access, etc. So there's a lot of management that goes with student accommodation that people aren't always aware of. Capital, roughly you're going to need 300000 in cash. That's again for deposits, buying costs, etc. You're going to need affordability of at least 1 million rand. Most student houses um, you know, in, 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 uh, are in the region of 1 million to, to 2 million. And you'll need, again, a good credit score. Skills, you're going to need, I'd say, three years of experience before you go into this strategy. And you're going to need a good caretaker, someone who lives on the property, who can manage the students, who can manage access, um, and who can give you live updates as to what's happening in your your property so as you can see um, it's not just about what strategy you're trying to achieve it's not just about being a landlord or a trader but it's also about saying how much time does each strategy take how much capital does each one take and how much skills and knowledge and resources does it take and can I realistically achieve it should I be focusing on the single lets right now because I want to build a bit of experience and then go into the blocks of flats or do I want to do some flipping because I've got the right team I've got the right experience I know my area so what can you do is a very important question to answer. Now there's different strategies um, and, and I, like to, I like to list them in a ladder format because similar to starting out in corporate, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. In property, you also have to start at the bottom. And the bottom of the, 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 the pyramid or the bottom of the, the property career is things like sourcing, wholesaling, brokering. This is where you find a buyer, seller, you bring them together, you make a commission. You don't need any capital, you don't need any experience. It's the easiest uh, starting point for property investors. Then you've got single lets, apartments, two, three, four hundred thousand rand in the low income market or 800 to 1.5 million in your high income areas. Those are very easy for people to get involved in. Banks are happy to finance those. Then you've got flipping. You know, this is where you need some experience and renovations and understanding lightstone and valuations to be able to succeed in that. The next level is HMOs, houses of multiple occupation, a bedroom, a five bedroom house, and you put five different tenants in there. Then you've got student accommodation, you know, which is quite self-explanatory. Blocks of flats is the next level up. Then you've got industrial, commercial, and you end up with developments. Developments is the top of the pyramid. That is where, you know, you're probably gonna make the most amount of money, but I would say you need at least 10 to 15 years of experience. I haven't even started with developments yet, and I've been in this game for 10 years, but I'm there at the blocks of flats. That's where my focus is. I do a bit of student accommodation. I don't do any of the four below anymore. That I started with sourcing, and then I did a few single lets and flipping. Um, but eventually, I found my way to the blocks of flats, and that's where I found my my niche. Um, eventually, I'll get into developments. But the point here is that you know, even though you might be starting out at a lower strategy, that's fine. You know, over time, as you gain an experience, like you would in corporate, you slowly start to build your wealth, uh, build your experience and your knowledge and et cetera, and you start to get promotions, the same thing will happen in property. Uh, remember to go and check out my YouTube channel. I've got a playlist on investment strategies. I take you through everything. Passive income, income strategies, new build, student accommodation, sourcing, wholesaling, all of that. Go check it out. So that is the key thing, is how do you determine your strategy? First, you've got to figure out your investor archetype and then match that with the resources you have and then you can move forward. Let's talk about finance, right? Finance is really important because property is the only asset that, or the only financial instrument that the banks are willing to lend on, which is what makes it so attractive, right? You can't get a bank loan from APSA to buy Bitcoin or to buy APSA shares or to buy the S&P 500. But you know you can go to the bank and ask them for a loan on a property and they most likely, if your credit score and affordability is good, they're gonna give it to you. So leverage, or bank finance and leverage is important because it helps you buy things that you can't normally afford. Now before we go further, we have to understand that there are two types of debt. There's bad debt and there's good debt. Bad debt are things like 
you know, credit cards, travel, cars, luxury, lifestyle items. When you use debt to buy things you can't afford and it doesn't provide an income, that's bad debt. You know, to, go, to use your credit card to buy clothes and to buy uh, an expensive travel holiday all over the world, that's a very bad use of debt. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to start crippling yourself because debt is, you know, credit card debt is very expensive. It's 20, 25%. Then you've got good debt. This is where you're buying or using the bank's money to buy things that are gonna increase your income. So buying a positive cash flowing property or a property that you're gonna flip for a good profit or paying for your knowledge. You know, if you take debt out to get a, take a student loan to get a degree that helps you get a really good job and then you're able to use the income from that job to pay off your debt, that's an example of good debt. So I'm never talking about bad debt. I don't, I don't subscribe to that. I avoid bad debt at all costs. But when it comes to good debt, using debt to buy properties that generate an income, it's good debt and that's what we need to be focusing on. So let me show you an example. Let's say that you wanna buy a, a single let. I've got an example here of a, of a flat in Heelbrow, which is in the Johannesburg CBD, which is a relatively high risk, high dense area. Now. If we had to say you've got the cash to buy this property or you could use finance, you could use the bank's money, which one is better? So here's a quick comparison, okay? If we were to buy this property cash, these would be the numbers. So the rent is 5,000, there's no bond, there's no mortgage, there's no loan repayments because we're buying it cash. The expenses, things like levies, rates and taxes, utilities, um, you know, whatever insurance provisions, all of that stuff, let's say it equals up to 1,800. So your cash flow, your positive cash flow at the end of the month is 3,200, which is fantastic. And that's quite high. The reason being is because you don't have a bond, which is usually the most expensive part. The capital you have to put in is the 300,000. So to purchase it for 250, plus some legal costs like buying costs and, uh, and, and transfer costs. So your return, which is the cash flow times 12 divided by the capital invested is 12.8%. It's not bad. You know, compare that to what you're getting at the bank, six, seven percent. It's a good investment, right? Let's look at the finance option. So let's say you go to the bank and you get a loan from the bank to buy this property. So instead of using your 300,000 Rand in cash, you're not going to use all of that. You're just going to use a portion of that because you're using the rest from the bank. Now, the bank's obviously going to charge you a monthly fee, your bond repayment, your mortgage repayment. Here I've just used property 24 as a quick example. So you can see with a purchase price of 250 on the left, with a deposit of 25,000 Rand, over a 20 year period, you can see on the top right that your bond repayment on this purchase would be 1744, all right? You've also got your once off costs. So you'd need to put a deposit of 25,000. You'd have to register the bond and you'd have to pay the property transfer fees of 55,000 Rand. So that's your capital invested. Right, the rest, the bank's going to fund. So, if we keep our expenses the same, our cash flow suffers. It's now substantially less. It's not 3,200 anymore. It's 1,500. The capital we've invested is not 300,000. It's only the 54. You times your cash flow by 12. You divide it by the capital invested to get your return on investment, which is now 32%. So... I hope that that shows that it makes a lot more financial sense to use the bank's money instead of your own money because your return is going to climb substantially. So if you had 300,000 Rand in cash, do you gonna go for cash purchase or finance purchase? Well, that's up to you. If you're gonna go the cash, unit, uh, cash version or approach, you can buy one unit, making 3,200 Rand cash flow, giving you a 12% return. If you use the bank's money, you can take that 300,000 and you can buy five, five and a half properties with a cash flow of 8,000 Rand at a return of 32%. So this is an example of good debt, guys. Not using your credit card to go and buy clothes that you can't afford to impress people you don't even like. Instead, it's about using good debt to buy income generating assets that improve your financial independence. Now options, what options do you have to finance? Right, there are mainly three options you can use. Bank finance, private finance, creative finance. So bank finance, right? this is where you've got your main banks, NetBank, Standard Bank, FNB, APSA, 
Capi Tech. You've also got another 50 odd registered banks in South Africa. You've got Tough, you've got Mercantile, you've got commercial, uh, Combined Finance, Sentinel Homes. You've got so many different financial providers. But these are your five big banks that are going to give you the best and most competitive rate. The criteria that banks will look at before giving you a loan are three things. Number one, your credit score. Now, I like to use a tool called clearscore.com. It's 100% free. Go register it for it now, clearscore.com. You log in, it'll then pull all of your credit information and will give you a score, right? Now, your score needs to be above 600, 690 for you to get a really good loan. Now, remember that each um, credit bureau, like Clearscore, has got a different way of measuring your uh, credit score versus someone like uh, TPN. Um, so, for example, in Clearscore, I've got a score of about 670, which is really high. So you've just got to understand that each one's got a different measuring measuring framework. Some use the the, the 300 to 850 range. Some some of them use the 600 to 700 range. Each one is different. Just make sure that you've got a good credit score uh, because that's going to impact the interest rate that you get. So get yourself on one of these tools um, and make sure that you're improving your credit score because that's going to affect the risk that the bank sees when they give you the loan and thus it's going to affect your interest rate. The second key criteria is they look at your affordability, i.e. how big is your salary and how much can you afford to loan. So the types of income used for affordability is obviously your full-time salary if you're a full-time employee. Self-employed individuals, they do look at some of that income but not all of it. Weekly wages, commission, housing subsidy, rental income, each bank is different. Um, APSA, for instance, takes 80% of the rental income and uh, adds that to affordability. Uh, some banks like NetBank aren't as, as generous. FNB, from my understanding, is a bit higher than that. You've got to go and speak to your banker. But remember that the amount of your salary will affect how big a loan facility you can get. So again, you can go to property24.com slash calculator slash affordability. Uh, you can put in the numbers and we'll tell you what your loan facility is. So here you can see I've used an example of a gross monthly income of 28,400 with a net monthly income of 28,400 with zero expenses at an interest rate of 8.25. And you can see that this person would uh, qualify for roughly a million rand loan. So go on to the property 24 affordability calculator, put in your, your, your salary and, and your expenses and see what kind of loan facility you, you apply for. And if you're able to apply for a million rand loan, well, then you know that student accommodation is maybe in a, a strategy that you could look at. If you can only apply for two, three, four hundred thousand rand loan, well, then you've got to go for your single debt strategy. Finance is very important for you also to, def to define what's a realistic strategy to get started with. Uh, when you're going for bank funds <clears throat> or bank finance, make sure that you've got some funds prepared because the bank is very rarely gonna give you 100% loan. They're most likely gonna give you 80 to 90%, which means you need to put down cash for the deposit, but also you're gonna to have to pay for transfer fees, you're gonna to have to pay for bond registration fees. So if you're going the bank finance route, it's not a zero cash game. You're gonna need some money. So I usually recommend, or, or people who wanna join my coaching program, I always tell them that before you can join, you have to have 100,000 saved up because you know, you know, when we start the coaching, we're going to be making a purchase and you want to be prepared and ready to, to get involved. Let's look at the second option, private finance. So we've looked at bank finance, which is the starting point for most people, super easy to get involved in. Private finance is a bit more tricky. This is where trust and credibility play a major role. Um, I usually say to people that, you know, you can only get private finance from friends and family if you've got no experience. But if you've got, if you want to, if you want to, you know, go to the random Joe Soap or random Sefiso and get their money to invest in the deal, you're going to need five years of experience. You're going to need a few case studies of good deals. You know, it took me probably eight years, uh, or no, seven years before I was able to loan private finance. So the first seven years, I was using my own money. I was using the bank's money. You know, I, I, I targeted a few friends and family who trusted me, and I got a little bit of funds from them. 
But then once I had a few years of experience, I had a few good deals, my reputation started to grow and I was able to go to private investors and say, look, this is the last deal that I did. This is the return. Here are my last three years of financials. You can see the performance of, of this building, for instance. That's when I started to be able to raise finance. So if you're, if you're starting out in the property game, private finance is probably not where you're going to go. But let's touch on what it is, right? So you've got two types of investor structures. You've got the investor who wants to be active and you've got the investor who wants to be passive. So an angel investor who wants to be active or an angel investor who wants to be passive. The active investor is someone who wants to be involved. They want to be a partner. They understand the property game. They can contribute not only capital, but time and experience. That is where you bring in the equity model, a partnership or JV model. That's usually what I try and do with my blocks of flats purchases is I get a couple of people who understand the property game, but they might have been buying new builds or negative cash flow investments and they want to come in and learn my models. So I bring them on, they bring a bit of capital, they bring some time and they bring their own experience. We create a partnership where each person gets a percentage share in the company based on the capital that they're contributing. And that is the model that works really well for your active investor. Your passive investor, this is someone who wants to carry on with their own lives and they just want to have a passive return. They don't really care about the property game. They understand business, but they don't want to know the property specific market. So they can contribute capital and maybe some experience or some knowledge, but they're not going to invest time. This is where I find a loan agreement works really well. A loan agreement is where I agree to loan money from you at a certain interest rate over a certain period of time. The passive investor takes no risk, right? If I take a loan from someone for 100,000 Rand, I have to pay them back that 100,000 Rand. I'm liable. Versus the JV partnership model, this is where we share the risk. Me and my active investors are, are, are betting together. We take the profits together, we take the losses together. So when you are in that level of being able to raise finance from a private investor, you've got to decide, am I gonna do the JV model? Am I gonna do the loan agreement model? Next, we've got creative finance. This is where you can use very little money to get involved in the property market. So I'm only gonna show one example of a creative finance strategy. You can go onto my YouTube channel and see a whole bunch more. This one's called the rent to rent model. Um, I like to call it the cash flow cow because <laughs> you're making lots and lots of cash flow uh, without a lot of capital to invest in. Okay. So how does this specific model work? It's quite interesting. It usually works well in student areas. So let's use that example. Let's say that you're an investor and you want to get into the student accommodation market. So you go to an area like Hatfield or you know anywhere close to a university and you find a five bedroom house. So you go to the owner of that five bedroom house and you say, look, I'll rent that property from you for 10,000, okay? Then the next step is that you sublet the property to five students, um, each at 4,000 per month, and you're making 20,000 Rand, right? So you're renting from the landlord for X amount. You're then subletting to a group of other people for a higher amount, right? And the difference between what you're subletting it for to what you're renting from the landlord is your cash flow. Now, obviously, your landlord, the person that you're renting from, needs to know that this is happening. They need to know that you're subletting. You can't do this illegally. You can't, or you can't do this without letting them know because that is legal. Um, but this is an example of a creative strategy, right? You're, you're only paying $10,000. you are subletting for $20,000. you are making a $10,000 cash flow, and you don't need any money down, right? Maybe the landlord will request that you pay two or three months deposit to secure um, this opportunity. But this is an example of a very low um, capital strategy and, and a creative one at that. Um, as, as exciting as this strategy is, please note that this is an incredibly hard deal to find and, and to put together because most landlords will not accept you to sublet their property. And if they see that you're able to do that, they're probably just gonna sublet themselves because they, they'll rather make the 20,000 than the 10,000. But I wanted, to, I wanted to spark your imagination and your thinking to say, you don't have to have money to invest in property. It is possible to do it without money. Um, raising finance is a very important area of the property game. I have created a playlist of raising finance, so how to do bank finance, how to do creative finance, other people's money, private finance, all of those things have been touched on. So go and check out that playlist. 
The ultimate thing that I want you to know about finance is that good debt is power and property is the only um, investment instrument where the banks are really willing um, and excited to lend. So make sure that you're not using cash to purchase properties, but rather using good debt because there you're going to scale your portfolio tremendously. Let's look at area. Now that you've got your, your strategy, you know that your financial resources work within the parameters of your strategy. Now we need to find the area where your strategy will work. Okay, so we've got the strategy, we've got our resources, we know what we can afford. Right? That's the important thing. We've done all this pre-work. Now we can decide what area we want to invest in. Okay, area research. There's a couple things you need to look at. Number one, proximity. When you're starting out in property, don't try and invest in another province or go and invest overseas. You know, invest in your area. Invest in an area where you can drive and go and see the property. Once you've done a few deals, 100% you can invest remotely. You know, I, I live in Cape Town and I invest, invest almost exclusively in Johannesburg. But that's also because I've built the team. I know the area. I've, I've done the flights. You know, in the beginning, start with close proximity. Is it feasible for your strategy? Right? You want to do student accommodation, but you know then, then you can't invest in some rural village which there's no student, there's no college, or there's no university close by. Right, So it has to be feasible. If you want to do student accommodation, you need to look at a suburb that's within five kilometers, or potentially two kilometers of a university or college, because that's going to attract students. LSM, right? Appreciation versus yield. If you want to do the cash flow strategy, you have to go for an area where the yield is positive, where the yield is greater than 15%. Now, what does that mean? Gross yield. This is the most important indicator that'll tell you which areas are good for cash flow. Okay. The way you work out your gross yield is you take your rental, you times it by 12, and you divide it by the purchase price. So here I've got an example. Let's say that you're looking at a at an area where the average rental is 10,000 per month, meaning the annual rent is 120, and the purchase price, the average purchase price is 800, right? You take the 120, you divide it by the 800,000, times that by 100, and it gives you a percentage. In this case, 15% is the yield. Annual rent divided by purchase price times 100 gives you your yield. Now, 15% in the South African context is a good sign. But it depends on the interest rate of the country you're investing in. So your gross yield aligns to the country's lending rate. Okay, Annual rent divided by purchase costs needs to be 5% greater than whatever the interest rate of the country you're lending in. So for example, in South Africa, the lending rate is roughly 10%. I think currently it's 8, 8.5%, but it's going to go up um, I think in the next in the next couple of weeks. So your minimum gross yield needs to be 15%. Why? If you've got a 15% yielding property, that means that you've got 15% to cover bond, rates and taxes, levies, etc. plus you're left with a bit of profit. If my gross yield was 10% and my lending rate was 10%, that means that my rent is going to go just to paying off the bond and everything else, levies, rates and taxes, all of those additional costs will be paid by my salary. So then it's a negative negative cash flow investment and then it's funding the short haul. If you were investing in the US, the lending rate at the time of this recording is 4.5%. So your minimum yield needs to be 9.5 in order for you to feel comfortable that you're going to get some sort of cash flow. In Belgium, the lending rate 3%, so your minimum gross yield 8%. In India, your, your, your lending rate, again, at time of recording is 8.5, so your minimum gross yield needs to be 13.5. And I say minimum. The higher your gross yield, the more likely there is a chance of positive cash flow. Okay. So remember to align it to your country's lending rate. So if you want to go for your cash flow, is the yield there? You want to go for your appreciation? Well, then you need to look at Lightstone and all your reports to see what the trends are. Is there appreciation happening in that area? What's the appreciation for the last 10 years and working that out? Property prices. Right? If you've got affordability for 1 million and you want to invest in Santon, you know, it's not going to work because your average property prices in Santon are two, three, four million, you know? So you also need to make sure that your affordability matches the area. Bank lending appetite, 
I know that for instance in your in your CBD areas, your Jobic CBD, APSA is the most prominent bank. They're the most likely to invest. They like that area. So does the bank have an appetite to invest in that area? And then reports, looking at, at your different reports, looking at Lifestyle, looking at TPN, here are some of the reports that you can get from a TPN perspective. And TPN, it costs, you know, 30 Rand for a report and you can understand the income levels, the demographics, you can understand um, the types of properties, what banks are lending in that area, you can understand all these different, uh, you know, intricacies of an area you can understand by paying less than 30 Rand for a report. How to find an investment area, you guessed it, I've got another playlist. <laughs> I've got investment grade suburbs for Western Cape, Gauteng and KZN. I've done a tutorial on TPN, on Lightstone, and also how to vet your tenants. All of that is on my YouTube channel. So that is how you can find an area. Meet those different criteria and then move forward. So let's say that you've decided you're going to go for your cash flow strategy. You know, that's your area of interest. You want to get that recurring income. You've looked at your credit score and it's good. It's between the good and the excellent. You've also looked at the, at the bank um, on Property24 and you know that you can... Uh, get a million rand affordability and you've decided that you want to be a student accommodation investor so let's say that that's the context you've done all of this pre-work and you've decided I'm going to become a student accommodation investor so when you start looking for stock for property stock so you need to find a property portal in South Africa the most common ones are private property and property 24 and every country will have its own designated portal where all the stock is being displayed so you've decided now student accommodation is where you want to get to. Now you need to go onto Property24 and search for different areas where student accommodation could work. If you're looking at the Johannesburg market, some of the, the, the areas you might want to consider are areas like Brixton, Freerdedorp, Hurst Hill, Auckland Park, West Dean. Those are all within the proximity of the University of Johannesburg and are very good areas to look at. If you're looking in the Pretoria region, you're looking at Hatfield, Sunnyside, Arcadia, uh, Linwood, Brooklyn, uh, Atterbury, those kind of areas. When you're in the Cape Town market, uh, which is the area that I invest in with student accommodation, you're looking at either your Stellenbosch market or you're looking at uh, areas close to uh, the University of Cape Town. Uh, you've also got the Tigerberg University or the, the university in that area, but I focus on uh, UCT. So areas like Rosebank, uh, uh, Rhonda Bosch, Woodstock, Observatory are really good areas. So in order to explain how I would go about analyzing a deal, um, I'm not going to use the My Property app, which if you've seen any of my other content, I, I usually use this tool to analyze deals. I'm just going to use a simple Excel spreadsheet calculator. But if you are interested in having a tool that helps you run the numbers, go look at this MyPropertyApp.online. I found a property here. This is actually one that I've uh, we purchased a couple of, a couple of months back. Um, so it's it's not a deal that's available anymore, uh, but I just wanted to use this for demonstration purposes. So this is an observatory, which is a very uh, popular student area in, in Cape Town, close to UCT, it's number six. The asking price of 1750. There's an uh, intro video that shows you what the property looks like. I obviously know what it looks like. And then here's some, in, uh, some important information, the monthly rates of 1,200. Um, the rental, it says here 39500 per month, which is roughly what we're getting at the moment. There are 14 students that are living there. Um, and uh, utility costs are less than 7,000 Rand. So here's some pictures of the property. It's already catered for student accommodation. There's 14 beds, 14 students can fit in there. Currently, it's fully occupied as of today. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we don't have any students that leave, but I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how I would have run the numbers on this deal. So I've got this very simple spreadsheet calculator. I usually give this to my students in the beginning when they're still learning how to do the numbers, and once they're comfortable with the spreadsheet, then they usually move over to the My Property app, which is a lot more sophisticated and and good. But for demonstration purposes, this should be enough. All right. So asking price for this property is one seven fifty. We got it at one point six million. So we got a 9% discount, which is not massive. I tend to recommend between 15 and 20% is, is, is a sweet spot, but Cape Town is very hard to find that kind of discount. We got a 100% loan to value at an interest rate of 7.5. Our buying costs 
where now buying costs are things like your transfer fees your bond registration fees um, you can use a uh, calculator called uber o o b a dot c o dot z a they've got a bunch of calculators on there alternatively the my property app will also give you the answer we paid about seventy five thousand for that now the rental income on this property there's 14 students paying on average three to fifty each so we're getting we're getting just shy of forty six thousand every month um, then we've got the expenses right so we're looking at this from a cash flow perspective so we have to work out rental income minus expenses whatever's left over is our profit and then once we have our profit we can work out what our return on investment is so the bond repayments is automatically worked out levies not applicable not on a freestanding house anyway rates and taxes one two one oh insurance we're currently paying 450. now these three management maintenance and vacancy often people are confused with this especially those who are new to the property market um, these are provisions that you have to put aside um, specifically these two the maintenance and vacancy are provisions you put aside for what could inevitably happen in the future so for example maintenance you know if you've got a if you've got a house like this a five bedroom house that's being used by 14 students you can imagine that 14 times people are opening and closing doors unlocking and locking using the bathroom using the facilities if 14 people are repeatedly using these facilities it's likely that you're going to have to do some wear and tear re renovations you're going to have to change locks you're going to have to change the lights and the fixtures and the fittings you're going to have to you know repaint and retile every two to three years you basically have to retile and uh, not retile repaint the entire house because you know students tend to be a little bit messy i remember when i was uh, a student many years back i didn't look at a house as a home i looked at it as a personal party zone you know i had a hubbly everywhere i had drinks i had friends coming over so that's a provision you set aside for the inevitable cost that's going to come Vacancy is also an important one because vacancy, you know, your property is not going to be fully let all year round. In fact, with student accommodation, you're only letting for 10 months of the year because students go home and they go on holiday between November and December. So right off the bat, I can say my, my vacancy percentage is going to be at least 16%, if not more. That's equivalent to two months. Actually, we worked on a 20% vacancy because, you know, the students are sometimes not paying on time or whatever it may be maintenance i'm going to put a 12 percent maintenance provision aside so that's taking 12 percent of the rental income we're putting aside away into a kitty so that you know every six to 12 months when we have to do whatever repairs we need to do we've got some of that's saved up and then management you know having a managing agent someone who lives on the property who can take care of the students um, but also do the marketing and the vetting of the students is very important so you can see that our expenses are around about, you know, 34, 35,000 Rand per month. So our cash flow is 12,000, just under 12,000 Rand per month with the return of 189%. The way you work out your return on investment is you take your cash flow times that by 12 to get an annual return divided by your capital invested, not the bank's money, but your own money, the money you've actually had to fork out. Now, if I go up here, we've got 100% loan. So the bank is covering the entire purchase price. The only cost that we have to pay is the buying costs. Is the 75,000 for the transfer and the, and, the, and, the, and the legal cost of transferring the property. So our return of 12,000 Rand per month is equivalent to 189% because 12 times 12 is 140. And we only put in 75. So we're almost making a 200% return on capital. Um, so that's an example of how you'd run the numbers, right? You have to get the rental income, you have to minus all the expenses, take out the provisions, get your, uh, your, your, your profit, your monthly profit, times about 12 to get your annual return divided by the capital you've invested. That'll give you a percentage. You can then compare whatever it is that you got, the 189%, for example, to what you're getting at the bank, right? The bank on average is offering five to seven percent on any kind of savings account so if you find a property deal that's bringing a five percent return i would say rather leave your money in the bank because there's risk in property you might not have tenants that pay on time so if you're only getting a five percent return leave your money in the bank where there is no risk you're getting your five percent return risk-free but if a property deal can bring you five ten twenty thirty forty fifty sixty seventy percent as it grows 
it obviously becomes more and more attractive. And you've got to measure what the risk to the return ratio would be uh, to see if that's something that you'd be willing to take on. Deal analysis can be tricky. It's very important that you run your numbers because at the end of the day, that's telling you if it's a yes, go for a decision, or if it's a no, I don't think this is the right kind of decision. Uh, in order for you to feel confident with deal analysis, I have got tons and tons and tons of videos on my YouTube channel. I've got a whole bunch talking about how to work out your gross yield, your ROI, how to do stress testing and due diligence. And I've also done uh, roughly 30 to 40 live deal reviews where I've actually gone and used the My Property app to analyze a whole different range of, of deals. So go check that out. Now, once we've found the deal we want to move forward with, right? We eager, we've, we've run the numbers, it makes all the financial sense. We know we pre-approved for the bond. We know we've got the finances, everything is sorted. Now what? Well, now you need to decide how are you going to make this purchase? Are you going to purchase it in your personal name? I.e., am I going to purchase it as Lawrence? Am I going to put it into a company where I own the shares of the company? Or am I going to put it into a trust structure? This is a tough question to answer and I always advise that you go and speak to an accountant or, or a specialist who can give you advice on your own personal unique situation. Everybody is different. Um, but I can give you, what I can do is I can give you pros and cons of each structure. But please go and speak to a professional, go and speak to your trusted accountant to make sure you find the structure that works best for you. So when we're looking at these structures, there's pros and cons to each one. Okay. From a risk perspective, the individual, your personal name is the most risky, right? If you get sued or whatever, anything in your personal name can be um, allocated. So there's very limited liability, there's unlimited liability, which basically means that you are liable for everything that could go wrong. In a company, you've got limited liability and in a trust, you can also limit that liability. Can you have multiple investors when you buy in your own name? No. But when they're using a company, yes, you can buy with multiple people. So if you're looking at doing some JVs, some, some partnerships, that's one of the reasons why I decided to go for a company is because I wanted to bring partners in, then that's a really good vehicle. Admin costs. From an individual perspective, very low. All you gotta do is a tax return, you can do it yourself. It's, it's very low on an administrative level. When you go in company and trust, it's slightly higher because you do have to do annual returns. I have my accountant do all of my returns for me. He does my annual financial statements, he does my tax returns, and he does my annual duties. Um, he does that for my company and for my trust. So that's it's a little bit more admin intensive and a bit more costly to run a company and a trust. But in my personal opinion, it, it, it those small costs far uh, are outweighed by the benefits of, of the limited liability and some of the tax perks that you get in the company and the trust. The income tax is a very important element. When you're going in a personal name, and this is probably the reason why I don't want to invest in my personal name, is because it's on that scaled level, right? So if you earn more, you pay more tax, and it works on a scaled bracket. Go check out SARS's website to find out what that, what that looks like. So as you put more properties into your personal name, and you increase your rental income, and, your, and, your, and essentially the income that you make in your personal name, you go higher and higher in the tax, in the tax brackets, and eventually you're going to be paying 45% in tax. Company flat rate of 28%, trust flat rate of 45%. So your company is your most attractive from an income tax perspective, your trust and your individual name are your least attractive. CGT, capital gains tax, when you're working within your individual name, 40% of the profit that you make is timed at 45% income, at uh, 45% tax rate. So your effective tax rate from a CGT perspective at 18%, with a company, 80% of the profit is taxed at the company rate of 28%, making it an effective rate of 22.4. And then in a trust, again, 80% of the profit made is taxed at the 45% income bracket, making it an effective 36%. Yeah, how do you extract these returns? How do you get money out of these different you know, entities? Well, within your individual name, there's no taking money out because it's already coming into your personal name. With a company, you can take a dividend out of the company. You can take an interest on loans. I tend to do that because it's it's the most tax efficient. Uh, or you can just pay yourself a salary. But then again, you're paying tax in your individual name. From a trust perspective, you can do in income or um, capital allocations. So pros and cons from each one. I recommend a company. I think the benefits are great. The tax perks are good and you get to limit liability. It's not super costly to set up a company. And then once you've built up a little bit of wealth, 
that's usually when I recommend a trust. Some of the deductible items that you might want to look at. So obviously, if you have a company or if you have a trust, you can remove some of those uh, expenses before you get profit, uh, before you get taxed on your profit. If you're looking from a cash flow perspective, these are some of the deductible items that you can take off of your profit. So rates and taxes, water and electricity, bank charges, the interest portion of your bond repayment, not the capital portion, levies, accounting costs, leasing commission, repairs and maintenance, and insurance. From a flipping perspective, the proceeds from the sale, base cost, agent fee, sales costs, like your certificate of compliance, improvements, and transfer fees. You can take all of these away from your profit before you actually get taxed. It's a nice perk to have. Uh, a lot of people ask me what my structure is, and, and I'm happy to share that with you, but I, I also just want to remind you one more time that it's important you go and speak to an accountant or specialist. Don't just follow my structure because you know you think that I'm doing it in the right way. Make sure that you get some you know some some professional advice. This was the structure that my accountant gave to me based on the situation where my company is and the vision that I have for the future. But anyway, I own a, a trust. Uh, my own full-on shares of the trust. The trust owns the shares of my holding company, and my holding company owns different equity stakes within various smaller companies. So you can see, for instance, uh, the Orange Company owns a few properties, plus it owns another company that owns a few company, uh, a few properties, and I'll have a 50% share in that company. Now, these numbers are obviously not super accurate. I'm using this more for demonstration purposes. The key thing you need to know is that I have a trust that owns the shares of a company and the company owns shares in various other companies where I have different partnerships, right? So for instance, in the orange company, I might have three or four partners. In the blue company, I might have five different partners. So this was for me the easiest way to structure it. I have one holding entity that owns all of my shares and that owns different equity stakes in different companies that own properties going forward. So now anytime that I want to bring a new company on board or, or bring together new partners to go and buy a building, what I'll do is I'll bring the five people together, we'll register a new company. I will then own the share, my share portion in this new company from my holding company shares. And then I can just expand, expand, expand. So this was the way that I structured it. Again, best to get advice from your accountant or your chosen professional to give you the best advice. Again, check out my YouTube channel. I've got a couple of videos around tax, structures, legals, signing OTPs, all of that stuff under the legals and structure playlist. So that's the structure, right? Personal name, trust, company, my personal recommendation, what I think you should start with is just get a company, right? It's gonna make the most sense uh, from a tax perspective and you get to limit some of your liability. Now that you've got your structure together, the next step is to sign the actual offer to purchase. Now an OTP is a legally binding agreement between buyer and seller. It has to meet certain suspensive conditions for it to be valid. And once you have your OTP, you can go to the bank and you can raise finance. So before you can even go to the bank, the bank's gonna expect the OTP. So it's a prerequisite before you can go ahead and actually raise finance. So some of the suspensive conditions that are important to use, these are the ones that I usually consider when I'm investing, is one subject to a builder's quote. I don't always have the luxury to go and view the property before I sign the OTP, so I wanna make sure that you know the, the OTP is subject to having my builder go in and give me a comprehensive quote on what needs to change, because that's gonna factor into my numbers, right? If I assume that there's a 100,000 Rand renovation bill, but my builder comes back and says, actually it's 400,000, well then I need to reduce my offer by 300,000 because I never accounted for that upfront. Subject to partner approval, that's a super one because it's super vague and easy to get out of. So, you know, let's say you've signed three or four OTPs and two of them come back as positive, but you aren't able to do two, then you can just say, sorry, my partner disapproved and you can get yourself out of one of those deals. Subject to a two week due diligence period, this is the one I use on every single deal. I tend to run the numbers quickly, sign an OTP with this clause, and if the seller countersigns my offer, uh, then I've got two weeks to get my TPN and Lightstone reports to do a deep dive into the numbers, to get my builder to go and view the property, all of those things. Subject to raising finance at a certain loan to value, at a certain interest rate, and then subject to tenants being evicted. You know, if I'm buying a distressed building and there's two or three bad apples in the block of flats, let's say it's 10 flats and there's three you know, tenants that are not paying, I can say to the owner, I'll buy this property, but you have to get rid of those tenants before I take, 
before I move forward. You know, so those are like examples, right? Um, here's an example of, of the addendum that I add to every offer to purchase. So I'll sign an offer to purchase at the terms that the seller wants, and then I'll have this addendum which I uh, attach to the offer. And here you can see the due diligence clause. The purchaser requests a two week due diligence period. During those two weeks, I will get proof of income, proof of expense, proof of the tenants, that they've been vetted, that they're employed, that they're in good standing, approved building plans, approved SG diagrams, zoning certificates, whatever it is that I want to see, I can make that a prerequisite or a, a suspensive condition. If anything is not met or not to my satisfaction, I can move out of the deal. Guys, this is one of the most important areas of, of property investing and probably the, the, the biggest thing that people during my coaching program get value from. Uh, you know, to, to be able to sit uh, down and have a very, very clear idea of what your risk is in the offer to purchase and being able to confidently exit a deal if something goes pear-shaped is completely, uh, is very, 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 very valuable. So that's the offer to purchase, right? You've got your structure, you've signed your OTP. Now the seller has countersigned, all the suspensive conditions have been met. Right? Now we're getting into the final stages of becoming a property investor. The next stage is your transfer process. Right? On average in the South African economy, uh, you're looking at a three to four month transfer window. So you might have one month to meet the suspensive conditions on your OTP. With my two week due diligence clause and the standard two weeks to raise finance makes it four weeks, which is roughly a month. So it takes roughly a month just to get the, the, the OTP signed by both parties. If that is then successful, then it goes into the three, four month window where the, the transfer actually happens. And having a good conveyancing attorney is absolutely critical in this stage. Now here you can see um, I, did a, I did a purchase a year ago and here you can just see the updates from my attorney. There were 21 steps followed in this registration. So first of all, the lawyer receives the instruction, the seller is contacted, buyer is contacted, title deed is received from the seller, rates figures requested. There's a whole bunch of steps. You don't need to know each step. Your transferring or conveyancing attorney should be contacting you and, and, and communicating with you on a weekly basis to say, this is where we're at, this is the next step, this is what is expected. But eventually you'll see when you start to go to the to the steps at the below, you've got point 19 is lodged. Once the property has been lodged, it's within a week or two that the property is going to be transferred into your name. It then goes into the prep stage and then it is finally registered. So as an example, this is what my attorney sent to us a couple of weeks ago with the, with the Donna Street property, the, the, the student deal that I just showed you. Um, this is an email that says we confirm that the above mentioned transactions was lodged at the Cape Town Deeds Registry this morning. So that's a very cool email to receive. I love these these emails. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, obviously you're going to have to pay your transferring attorney whatever the fee is that they have allocated. So with this specific one, the legal fees for this transfer was 34800 plus we had the bond registration costs, which is why, why I allocated 75000 into the buying costs during the deal analysis. Uh, you can obviously go on to uber, oba.co.za. Here's a quick screenshot of what that app will show you. It'll tell you what your bond registration costs are, what your transfer costs are, etc. cetera. Uh, and then, yeah, we got this email to say it was lodged, this address, lodgement of the deeds office today. This was last week. So we should have this property transferred into our name in the next couple days. Um, so yeah, it goes into prep, then it goes into registration. And then the final step after the property has been transferred into your name is management, right? Now you're a landlord, now you're an owner. Now you need to make sure that the property performs uh, to the level that you expect it to, right? So there's a couple stages here. You've got to make sure that the performance of the asset works to your, to your, your, your need and your expectation, you know, like with the numbers that we ran, we had 14 students paying 3,250 per month. So we have to be on those students every month. We have to say, hey, where's our rent? Where's our rent? Where's our rent? If we don't get paid the rent, this isn't a, an asset. This is a liability, right? You have to do tenant marketing and vetting. So bringing students in and then vetting them to make sure that they are students, that they NISFAS accredited, that their parents can afford to pay the rent. Evictions, that's part of management. Unfortunately, you, 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 if you don't have the stomach to do an eviction, then maybe the property market isn't where you should be going. 
renovations, uh, utility bills, managing costs, all of those things. So specifically within cash flow performance management, what I tend to do is I'll look at the return every single month. Here is a, an example of a block of flats that, um, that I purchased a while back. It's six times two bedroom. And here you can see the performance over the last six months. So January all the way through to June. So you can see the green bar. That is the, the average rent that this apartment block is generating. So it's generating between 30 and 40,000 Rand per month. So whenever it starts to go below 30,000, I can already say you know, something fishy is happening here. It's been, it's been pretty standard. So I need to be tracking that. Who's not paying? Which of the six tenants aren't meeting their bills? Make sure that the, vacant, uh, the, the delinquency rate is low. If a tenant is missing repeated payments, okay, well, then I need to you know, kick off my eviction process. Uh, then you can see the expenses, the red line. Um, and and um, what's quite obvious to see is in April, my expenses were exceeding 40, 45,000 Rand per month. And the reason being is I had to do my fire certification. I actually had to bring in, um, what do they call it? You know, those round fire things, the fire hose, the fire hose, um, in order to get compliance with, um, with, uh, with my fire standards and fire regulations, which is important when you've got a block of flats, when you've got multiple residents. So that's the reason why I had a spike in profit. But yeah, in April, my cash flow was negative. That's the purple bar. So unfortunately, the month of April was a tough month, but everything else is performing as it should. As long as your income is steady and your expenses are managed, you can, you can, you can do quite well. And what, you, what you'll also notice, I'm hoping you're seeing, is that it's volatile, right? Some months are good, some months are bad. When I'm running my analysis, when I'm doing my, due my, my, my deal analysis, you don't take these into account. You don't take volatility into account. You know, it's unfortunate, but your tenants aren't always going to pay every single month the full amount at the right time. You know, so you, you need to be flexible. You need to have some cash flow saved up so that on the bad months, like in the month of April, I had to put money into this investment because it didn't do well. All right. Here's another deal which is a lot more stable. It's nine two bedroom apartments. Um, and you can see we've got a, a, a consistent a, a consistency in the cash flow, right? So the rental is fluctuating between 40 and 50,000. The expenses are fluctuating between sort of 25 and 30. So our cash flow is, you know, it's, it's pretty consistent, um, fluctuating sort of the 15,000 Rand per, per month mark. Now, this is a great deal because our tenants are paying on time. The nine bedroom apartments is in a very good area, very, very stable deal. The six the six bedroom apartment is in a bit of a, a higher risk area. So my, my management is important, but that's, that's besides the point. The point is you have to be on top of this. You have to know, you know, you have to know all your tenants. What are they paying? What are they behind on? Uh, you have to be on top of this stuff because you have to make sure that this asset performs as you, as you need it to. Tenant vetting. On the left, you can see a couple of things that I'll do in order to vet my tenants. I'll do an affordability check. So how much is their salary? Can they afford to live there? Are they employed? Phone the employer, make sure that there is proof, proof of income, bank statements, pay slips, that kind of stuff. Credit score and payment behavior. On the right, you can see a rent check, which is done through TPN. So whenever I'm looking at a tenant, I can see what their payment behavior is. I pull one of these reports and I can see that this person has got an F rating, F out of, so it starts in A, ends at F. I'm not going to take on an F tenant. I'll take on an A, a B, and potentially a C. Um, you know, so you, I found that evictions are almost impossible if you do your vetting upfront correctly. So the only time I really do an eviction is when I'm taking over an asset and if I'm buying from someone and the tenant has been delinquent for long and I have to get rid of them. But as soon as I've taken over a building, any new tenant that comes in, I've always vetted and I don't have to do any evictions. I've got a great video on YouTube called How to Vet a Good versus Bad Tenant where I go into detail of how you can look at this rent check scorecard and, and really make an informed decision. Evictions, it's a tough one. You know, it's never, it's never nice and it's never easy to evict someone. But um, unfortunately, uh, it's either you or them, right? So they're either going to stay in your property for free and, and, and get a free ride and you're going to have to pay for their expenses or you're going to do the uncomfortable thing and chase them away. Now, within evictions, you always have to do a cost-benefit analysis. Depending on the market you target, I target the low-income market. So the way I do an eviction is different than you know, what, what I might consider the legal route. Um, I have to be careful how I say this, but 
you know, you, you've got the legal way of evicting someone and then you've got the, you know, let, the, let's say the frowned upon or the not so legal way. Um, some of those options are like to make things really uncomfortable, to switch off the electricity, to switch off the water, to change the locks. I'm not saying that I do these things, but those are some of the incentives that you can have to try and make it more uncomfortable for the person so that they do leave. One of the strategies that I do with the student housing is if a student doesn't pay, I switch off their Wi-Fi. Now, you know that students can't live without Wi-Fi, so as soon as that's off, they go to their parents, they start complaining, and either they move out because they can't live without Wi-Fi or um, the parents pay. Um, another strategy that you can use is to uh, put a clause in your OT in your lease agreement that says, if you miss payment, I will sublet the unit. So if the person misses a payment, you put another family in there or you plant to plant a plant a bad person in the property who then makes it really uncomfortable and, and gets them to leave so you got to do you got to do the cost benefit analysis right you can go the legal route it's going to cost you 30 to 150 thousand rand it's going to take a whole bunch of months if you're working in the low income market it doesn't make sense so you have to find creative ways to get people out now if you go the legal route which i recommend especially with your affluent more affluent areas you've got two options Either the tenants are going to leave unopposed, which means, you know, once you go to court, they're going to leave pretty soon. Your timeline is one to three months and it's going to cost about 30,000 Rand. The opposed is different, right? If the tenant opposes it, it could take up to 18 months and it could cost 150,000 Rand. So this is where that cost benefit analysis comes in. Again, if you're targeting the low income market, the inner cities of Johannesburg and Pretoria, you can't be putting 150,000 Rand into every eviction. The property costs 150,000 Rand, the, the apartment, you know. Um, so you have to find those ways to make life a bit more uncomfortable. Again, I don't want to share too many things on, on here about my eviction process because, you know, um, it, it can sometimes be frowned upon. If you do go the legal route and do an eviction, these are the four stages that your, your, your attorney will take. They'll send a letter of demand, a cancel agreement, an eviction application to the court, and eventually the, the court will order, will send a, an eviction order, which means the sheriff goes to the property and forcibly moves and removes the person out. So my, my main advice here is please contact and, and consult with an attorney. Please don't take what I've just told you as uh, what you can do. I'm not an attorney. I'm not a specialist in this space. I've got a really good attorney who I always vet all of my decision making with. Um, so you need someone like that on your power team just to make sure that you're within line you're doing that cost benefit analysis it's not a ridiculous cost but you're also not doing something that could you know end you in hot water i do have a video on youtube called the craziest eviction ever where i, I take you through a detailed step um, that i took to to do my worst eviction which took four months and cost ten thousand rand which is not that bad um and I also share 10 horror stories from uh, 10 years of experience in, in managing properties. So go check out this video if you are interested in the management side of property. You know, once it's actually transferred into your name, this is a great video to show you what, what you could potentially be up against. For those of you who do want access to exclusive content, things that I don't share with the general public, please go and look at my channel membership. Um, it's a very cheap subscription and it gives you access to exclusive content uh, that can help you on your property journey. My final nugget and piece of advice before I let you go is mentorship. Now, this is a guy that hopefully you know, most of us do know. His name is Jay-Z. And in June of 2019, he made the history books by becoming the first hip-hop's proven and viable billionaire. Um, and, and the reason why he's become a billionaire is not because of his music, although his music is fantastic and he's an icon. It's because of all the businesses and investments he's made with the money he's made from, uh, from music. Now, the reason why I'm bringing him up is because he really changed his tra trajectory of his wealth creation when he started getting mentored by one of the most successful and innovative investors of our generation, Warren Buffett. He took him on as a student and through all of his different advice and, and clever investing, Jay-Z, you know, made it into the record books. Uh, so my final bit of advice is to find a mentor, to find somebody who you can learn from who's in the market. One of my favorite quotes is that success leaves clues. So choose wisely who you model for you become them. You know, you don't go into a, a KFC and go find a big guy and ask him, how can I lose weight? Or how can I get into shape? You know, that, that's silly. 
Um, you go to a personal trainer who's got a six pack or who's got a bikini body and you say, hey, how did you do that? that you know, you want to learn from those who are doing, who are living and breathing what you want to see. So with that, uh, to end off, I do have a coaching program. So if you're interested in the low income cash flow market, I am your guy. Um, I think when you are considering a coach, it's important to know what their niche is. If you're looking at flipping or wholesaling or development, I'm not your guy. That's, that's something I have some experience in, but that's not my specialization. So if you are interested in the cash flow market and the low income LSM, I'm your guy. I have a very structured coaching program and I can help you secure a deal in under three months going through very structured processes. Uh, I'll take you through roughly 10 modules from strategies, area analysis, deal analysis, OTPs and negotiation, due diligence and finance, all the way through to structures, legals, transfer and management. Also go check out on my YouTube channel a whole bunch of success stories and case studies of students of mine who are now property investors after going through my program. Uh, if you'd like, please go to my website, lawrencebull.com slash schedule an appointment for a free 15 minute consult where we can discuss your situation and whether my coaching program might be fit for you. I really hope that you enjoyed this tutorial and educational. Uh, please don't forget to click subscribe, join the tribe if you like my vibe and please share with friends, family, with anybody that you think could benefit and hopefully I'll see you soon. Until next time, happy investing.